All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, joining our workshop this evening. My name is Amy Tatterton. I am the Director of Learning and Connection at the Sineve Family Foundation, and my pronouns are she, her. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Sitsika, the Pakani, and the Guyanai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We'd also like to recognize those that live, work, and play on other treaty regions of Alberta and who may be either presenting or attending uh, this evening. The Sineve Family Foundation is an operating foundation based in Calgary, Alberta, that aims to improve education, employment, and housing outcomes for autistic and neurodivergent youth and adults. Our vision is that autistic adults live, learn, work, and thrive in their communities and realize their desired futures. We operate a collaborative space called the Ability Hub, where we develop programs and offer services and supports that help people achieve their goals. Our mission is to reduce barriers and enhance opportunities for autistic youth and adults by identifying targeted areas of need incubating innovative solutions, sharing promising practices, engaging community and informing systems change. For information about our programs, services, supports and resources, please visit our website at sinevefoundation.org. The Sineve Family Foundation is proud to have a long-standing partnership with Alberta Health Services Community Education Service. We are so grateful to our technician and supporter this evening, Laura. Community Education Service offers upwards of 100 free online presentations each year. April is Autism Acceptance Month, and we believe in elevating and amplifying autistic voices in our communities all year long. And having a month to sharpen our focus on these things is significant. We know that sharing stories and lived experiences makes a positive difference in the lives of autistic individuals, providing opportunities to increase understanding and acceptance of autistics, and in doing so, removing societal barriers they face. We are committed to broadening perspectives where we have influence and creating a world where autistics can reach their full potential. I'm so proud to present our um, presenter this evening. Her name is Terry Robson. Terry is a consultant, advocate, and self-proclaimed awkward spirit. Terry has set out to demystify Asperger syndrome, a diagnosis she received later in life. In 2013, that title was grouped into the umbrella diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. You can just imagine having an aspect of your identity being renamed after so many years. Terry is able to give a first-hand account of this experience. Terry's list of accomplishments is long. She is a celebrated presenter, writer, president of the Edmonton Strathcona Lions Club and proud member of Lions Club International, through which she has received a number of awards and certificates. She currently sits on the editorial board for the Canadian Journal of Autism Equity. Today, we will hear Terry's personal journey, along with practical information around what you may see in school, the home, and the workplace with neurodiverse individuals. True to her commitment to demystify what was Asperger syndrome, Terry has a collection of helpful tips and tools that make communities, workplaces, and schools more inclusive and considerate. Uh, we'll absolutely have a discussion about the unwritten rules of social relationships that she has navigated in her life. Terry's story will not only leave us with helpful information and the opportunity to hear a firsthand perspective of neurodiversity, but an overall feeling of joy and gratitude for the awkward spirit in everyone's lives. So with that being said, I would like to pass the microphone off to Terry. Thanks very much, Amy. I really appreciate it. Hello to everybody out there in the audience. This is a bit of a new experience for me. I'm usually at an in-person event. 
So right now, because I need to have somebody to engage with, I have four stuffies sitting up on my table <laughs> so that I can look at something and. <laughs> what a, what a creative solution, Terry. I love it. <laughs> you know, I have to have some eyeballs staring at me or this just is not going to work. Yeah. So as, as Amy had mentioned, I received my diagnosis quite early, actually, not in my life, but in terms of it being called Asperger's syndrome. So it hit the diagnostics and statistics manual in late 94, early 95, and that's exactly when I received my diagnosis. So I was diagnosed with having Asperger's syndrome. So my identity for the last 27 years has been as an Aspie. So then when they all of a sudden decided to <clears throat> put it under autism spectrum disorder, I'm like, no, I don't have autism. I'm an Aspie. And and the funny thing is, is many, many people who have Asperger's syndrome will tell you exactly the same thing is that, no, I'm not autistic. I, I have Asperger's syndrome. And now we're in this new age of they, they're wanting things to be um, person centered. So it's the person first who happens to have autism or like, you know, not not I am Brenda, I have autism, you know, because a lot of what happened in society and still does, unfortunately, is that we get treated by our, like we get labeled by what our label is and that's how we're treated. We're treated just like autism. We're not treated like a person with autism or Asperger's syndrome or any of the myriad other invisible disabilities. We, you know, we're treated like th that label that we've been given. And for me, even though I identify as an Aspie, I am not ableist, meaning I do not let people define me by that label of an Aspie. I am Terry. I love to do things like camp, read, hang out with my friends, talk to my stuffies. <laughs> <laughs> and in the midst of all that stuff, there's a part of me that is my Asperger syndrome, but that by any means is not all of who I am. So I struggle with the person first thing. And I like to say to people, it's like, okay, cool. I respect the fact that that's how you pre prefer to be addressed. And I said, I don't have an issue with that whatsoever because this, that's what you want. I will do that for you, but then please show me the same amount of respect by going, okay, if you want to be called an Aspie, then yeah, we'll call you an Aspie. It's not the be all and end all. And I know there's some things about Hans Asperger syndrome that make it seem like a really, you know, a bad thing to be named for, but just because the person was a jerk doesn't mean everything that he did in terms of science and other stuff is, is bad because it helped give a name and some help for people who had issues going on in their life and they had no idea whatsoever what they were. So even though they've changed it for a variety of reasons, I will probably till the day I die refer to myself as an ass because you you know you can't all of a sudden tell me I'm a circle and then 27 years later go no you're a square <laughs> no 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 it doesn't work that way point. I'm sorry I'm yeah. gonna be a circle <laughs> so. what a, yeah what a great way to put it Terry I appreciate that yeah okay yeah. so we'll get on with the presentation here I think that's all I needed to sort of say in preference um in, okay first day of my new lips. Um, prior to getting on with this, other than I am probably going to use terms like autism spectrum disorder and Asperger syndrome mixed throughout the presentation because th that's kind of how I've always done it. So, and if I accidentally say something that offends somebody, please do not take it personally. Part of the thing with Asperger syndrome is it is a social communication disorder. So I don't always know the right things to say, or sometimes I open my mouth and um, trust me, other people are not the only ones astounded by what just came out of it. So <laughs> I've worked really hard at, at not doing that and, you know, grabbing a filter as it comes running by me, but um, sometimes things still do slip out. So I apologize in advance because nothing is meant with malice of forethought or any intent to offend. So we'll get going here on the presentation. So what you see in front of you is a spirit face that I carved. And um, it says, through our eyes, people see things they have never seen before. Through our words, people hear things they have never heard before. But through our spirit, people are taken on a journey of discovery. And I have been told by many people that this is really true of hanging out with Aspies because we see things differently. So that enables others to see things differently as well. And Terry, what a beautifully intricate uh, carving. I, I remember the first time I saw that picture, I was like, wait, one more time, you did that? 
<laughs> yeah, I yeah. <laughs> incredible. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. So just just my slide here of who I am. You'll see some more information at the end. Should any of you wish to contact me for anything, there's going to be an info slide coming up. So my company, I call it Awkward Spirit Looking Beyond the Mask. And as you can see here, we have the two drama faces. And for me, there's a real duality in this looking beyond the mask part. Because of the communication disorder part of our um, syndrome, we do not read nonverbals. We can't read nonverbals. We don't pick up those nuances in tone that people use. We, we don't read facial expressions very well. So when you consider that about 95% of communication in this world is nonverbal, we're kind of hooped. You guys might as well be in a cardboard box speaking monotone from all we can pick up from seeing you or listening to you. I have learned to pick some up. Sometimes I could still be totally oblivious to the fact that I've really upset somebody and I just kind of carry on and it's not till somebody gives me a poke or goes, Terry, and I'm like, what? And then I kind of look at the other person and go, oh, okay, so what have I said that has offended you or, you know, made you angry or whatever? So one of the things about the looking beyond the mask is that we want to learn to, to be able to look beyond that mask that you have. And that's a mask that's put there by the syndrome not by you, but by the syndrome. So we need to figure out how to get that. But more importantly than that, we want you to look behind the mask of what you see on our faces and see who we are as people. I'm not just an Aspie. I am Terry with the plethora of things that make up me and just a little bit of that is, is Aspie. So we want you, I want the intent is to have people look behind our mask so that you can see the person that is underneath there. Okay, so here's a bit of, <clears throat> excuse me, additional information about Asperger syndrome. Most, most of them have normal general intelligence. Actually, most people with Asperger syndrome have average to above average IQ, um, but it's, it's really hard to do by an IQ, just to do an IQ test and say that somebody's got Asperger syndrome. There is a marked difference though in the two sections of the IQ system, the verbal and the performance. And if it's a they call 0.5 a large <laughs> difference, right? When you're when they're looking at it, and mine are six point six full points apart when you look at the two portions of my IQ. So if it's marked disparity like the 0.5, then that's a one of the indicators that the person you're um, testing may or may not have Asperger syndrome. Okay, the ratio of Asperger syndrome is eight to one, boys to girls, but depending on what you read, it also goes to four to one. And I think it's becoming more four to one because we're finally testing women. And we'll talk in a little bit, we'll talk about the differences in testing and stuff. So stats show that the rates of autism and Asperger syndrome are increasing, not because more and more people in the world are getting autism spectrum disorders, but because we have developed much, much better testing methods and people are getting tested later in life. Um, I was reading or talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago and they just got their diagnosis and they're 60. I thought it was bad when I got mine at 33 because at that point that was, you know, that felt like forever. So getting my diagnosis is like, oh, but this is really cool because now I understand why I did all those things growing up and why I still do some of those things now. And for me, it was like the weight of the world was gone. I'm thinking, you know what? People are still going to think I'm weird, but I'm cool because now I know why I'm weird and it's okay. I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry, you also just re uh, recently sat on a on a panel of uh, women uh, with late term late in life diagnosis, correct? With actually, actually, uh, with Aid Canada. Them. Yeah, there were two of them. One was at the Canadian Autism Leadership Summit, and so that was um, late diagnosis. And there were three women. And then on the seventh, I did a webinar through aid canada and again there were three of us and it was an adult diagnosis panel we did a webinar and we had a couple other people there one of them was a researcher from rutgers university um, dr elizabeth kelly who works with alberta health services and does a uh, vast majority of the testing the like the program that she's involved in and we found out that day that the testing is the wait list is six years long wow. to get tested like mm -hmm. that's just appalling because it it makes such a difference um and i might as well digress here to what i was going to talk about a little bit later but we're kind of on the subject 
um, a lot of women, because of how they've learned to mask themselves or camouflage who they are when they were growing up as little girls, they tend to be very shy and introverted. Um, they, they stay within themselves. They, they read a lot. They don't participate in a lot of things. They're not very outspoken, whereas myself tended to be, because I've always been a tomboy, I was more like the boys. I was the kid who's yelling the answer out in class, you know, and, and when the teacher goes, can somebody other than Terry please answer? It like, <laughs> Terry had already answered. It's like my yep. hand was attached to my mouth. Hand up, mouth open up goes the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a little bit, I mean, everybody knew there was something different and I knew there was something different about me, but I did not know what it was. And because I didn't know what it was, and I had no way to put what I was feeling into words, like it's very hard for us to label emotions. As I got older, I finally thought, I feel like about a, a volcano about to erupt. And I finally put that together with being really angry or being really mad. But at the time, I could only visualize this volcano just ready to spew its gases and the lava everywhere. And so that's what I had to use to try and describe what it was that I was feeling. And even now, sometimes I struggle for as much as I write poetry and I write other stuff. I struggle with words at times mm -hmm. and especially when it comes to feelings and emotions. And I remember one time I, we'd been talking about something and a friend goes, so how do you feel about that? So I proceeded to, to go on and on for a little bit. And then she goes, no, that's how you think. I want to know how you feel. And I'm like, no. That's how I feel. She's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah. yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, back to your slide, just where you made the point about, you know, uh, the rates of autism increasing. I think it's fantastic that you can sit in front of these groups and, and describe your experience because it, you're right. Not more people are people aren't more people aren't getting diagnosed. It's that the the we're noticing it more. And they yeah. oh, yeah. exactly. And I see this is obviously an old presentation because it says symptoms usually persist into adolescence and adult life. They don't usually, they always do. There is no magic switch at the age of 18 that goes, poof, okay, you're done. As the government seems to think, but they're funny cluing in and they're starting to put money into programs and stuff. Yeah. And it is often not diagnosed until later in life, especially with women. Part of what happens with women prior to their diagnosis with an autism spectrum disorder is they will get charged charged, diagnosed with a mental health disease. So it's really hard then to lose that stigma of that initial diagnosis, because a lot of times they don't take it off the chart. So if they say that, oh, you've been diagnosed as being bipolar, they totally ignore and disregard the other symptoms that have brought you maybe into emergency or have brought you to the doctor. So it's really hard to get past that. And with autism spectrum order disorders being an invisible disability, they are often relegated to that whole thing like mental health issues. And so there's a stigma attached to them. And I remember when he first told me, I was a little bit freaked out because I heard the word autism and back in, in, in the day when I got my um, diagnosis, my brain immediately went, Rain Man, you know, and that little boy rocking in the corner and I'm like, well, no, no, I'm not like that at all. And then I started that was, doing... that was the only point of reference you, you had. Yeah, exactly. And cause I got, like I said, I got diagnosed 94, 95. So there wasn't really anything else to relate to, but when he said it's, you know, Asperger's syndrome, I started doing the reading and I'm thinking, okay, just put my picture here beside it. We'll be good. <laughs> be really good right yeah. there. Absolutely. Sorry, well, I think, yeah, I think you mentioned there's a, a little bit later in your presentation too, you come back to some of the um, talking specifically about, about the um, women, like women later in life and, and diagnosis too, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we ask, we see things in black and white for the most part, like we're, we're pretty, we take things pretty literally understanding the world around us. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and it is. And I remember I was taking, um, I was pursuing a designation as a professional accountant. And I mean, give me numbers. I'll find you that penny. I don't care if we're a multi-million dollar company. I will find you that lost penny. But mm -hmm. then it came to management accounting and there's no black and white in management accounting. It's all gray. I'm like, okay, there goes the accounting career down the tubes because <laughs> I really, really struggled with that class because I just, I couldn't. I couldn't get those gray areas. They just kept disappearing on me. 
Okay, so here we get to the nitty gritty of the stuff. What you're gonna see in the classroom, in the workspace, at home, you might even see it out on the street or when you're walking through Walmart, because goodness knows I've done some strange things when I've been in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have, you'll, you'll see that we have difficulty with the nonverbal aspects of communication. That's, so that's what I talked about. We don't get the nonverbals. We really have problems understanding slang, idioms, figures of speech. Um, difficulty with sarcasm. I've told you this story before, Amy, but this, this little kid, he's in grade one, you know, and he's doing like a little, little boy with glasses. He's doing, he's probably got his feet up on the desk and checking out his sneakers and the laces and then looking around at the ceiling and the floor doing everything, but what he's supposed to be doing. And the teacher comes around to collect the papers and she goes, sometime today would be nice. You know, and she was really sarcastic about it. So he thinks nothing of it and he just, they just carry on with the rest of the day and it comes time to go home and he brings up this sheet of paper and she goes, well, what's this? And he says, well, you told me sometime today would be good. So here you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you really have to watch what you say to us because we don't get sarcasm and we also <laughs> take things extremely literally. I couldn't sit still for, I'm sure, a nanosecond when I was a kid and my grandma would always go, do you have ants in your pants, Terry? And I'd be like, no, and then of course I'd look to see if I had ants. In yeah, my pants you're like, do we do we have an ant infestation or? <laughs> like, you know, we're living in a, in a you know fifth floor of an apartment building, Grandma. What are you doing with ants up here? <laughs> and a lot of time, especially with the, the younger kids, you'll get like this little professor thing in terms of verbal communication. They won't talk with you. They won't talk to you. They will talk at you about what interests them. So, and little boys with Asperger syndrome and autism spectrum disorders, about the age of three, four, and five, love dinosaurs. I don't know what it is, but they just love dinosaurs. So, everything you did not want to know about a dinosaur will be told to you <laughs> by this little five-year-old boy. And it's it's really funny because they could care less that you're interested or not. They just have to be able to tell you what it is that's going on for them. And in their world, the only thing that matters is dinosaurs, and it doesn't matter to them that you're not listening. Um, we don't get a lot of types of humor, but verbal humor and puns. Oh my gosh, I love puns. Um, <laughs> I did one today. I'm following this new um, food eating plan and they were talking about three things you could do to ground yourself. And one of them I said is, put your finger, finger in the electrical outlet. <laughs> and I'm going, pun intended, but don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so then the instructor sends back, oh, that was absolutely shocking. And I'm like, uh-oh, here we go. Oh. Uh oh, now we've got, you're having, you're in like a pun competition now. <laughs> oh, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. And as I said earlier, we really have difficulty recognizing and labeling emotions that lead to frustrations. And we get frustrated because we don't know how to tell you what we feel. And then we get frustrated to that point where we don't know what else to do. And that can lead to the escalation of behaviors and the meltdown. And I still sometimes have meltdowns and I'm 60 years old. And let me tell you, it's it's not a pretty sight sometimes. <laughs> it's like, oh man, are you saying? And luckily, I do them when it happens. Usually, if I'm around close friends or if I'm home alone, and it doesn't happen too much out in public. Which, you know, I'm very thankful for because you get some really strange looks when you're having a bit of a meltdown in your 60s. And our emotional reactions often seem out of context because they seem really, really big compared to what may have been just like a minor little incident in the minds of most people but we we can't explain that to you and i know stuff gets stuck in my head sometimes emotional things and if i don't talk to somebody about it it's so big i don't know how to deal with it so i'll phone up a friend and i'll go blah 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 blah, blah. well you know i can't do anything about that yeah i know i just need to get it out of my head because it was taking up way too much space so you'll find that with a lot of us okay overstimulation you ever wonder about that kid screaming at the far end of the mall <laughs> and you can hear him and you're way at the other end it used to just drive me crazy and now i wonder now is that a young child with an autism spectrum disorder who is so overstimulated he can't handle it he or she can't handle it and it'll be the little girls that are doing the shrieking the little boys will probably knock stuff off shelves but the little girls will shriek they seem to have a special shriek 101 button that they flip at times so too much noise, too many people, too much color and design, like where's Waldo puzzles? Make me crazy. I love jigsaw puzzles, but I can't do where's Waldo. It's, it's, it's too much and I get just overstimulated. So 
so quickly. Some of the things that you can do to alleviate some of that is put noise canceling headphones on your child and sunglasses, you know, and then they can think they're cool, got their shades on, got their headphones on, maybe they've got some music going on. But yeah, you can, depending on the child, you can get overstimulated in your own home. Like one time I made the mistake of walking, watching Fantasia and then Fantasia 2000 back to back. I think I was wired for the next two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, can you say overstimulated? Whoa. <laughs> So I don't recommend not going to do that again. <laughs> no, no, never again. So some of the other things that you'll see is that we have, we tend to be hypersensitive with all of our senses. So when I'm talking ta tactile, I'm touch, talking touch. Like um, how many times have you seen people scratching at the back of their neck, just like mad and stuff. And it's because of the tags in the shirts. I'm so glad somebody got smart and quit putting tags in shirts. The vestibular that you see on the screen here is all about balance. I have like no sense of balance. The, the tests they always want to do to see if you have problems with balance, you know, stand with your eyes closed. Well, Terry almost immediately topples over. So then it was like, oh, well, you're going to need a walker. Okay, let me tell you, I've done this since I've been, you know, tall enough to stand up, but no, Terry had to get a walker. Proprioception. Now, try that word fast a couple of times. Now, yeah, that proprioception <laughs> is is determining where uh, an object is in space compared to where you are. I can't count the number of times I've gone to sit down and it's like somebody has yanked that chair out from behind me. I knew it was there because I turned, I looked at it, I saw it, I go to sit on it and I miss it completely. Or a wall will jump out and get me, <laughs> you know? It's like we have no sense, no body awareness of where we are in space. And that's why I am, I'm always bruised. People will be like, how'd you get that bruise? I don't know. You know, might have been a wall, might have been a chair I missed, could have been something. Mm -hmm. We have some, you know, we can have some visual hypersensitivity as well, like bright lights, flickering lights. Flat screen TVs are awesome. I remember when we had the old, you know, the cathode ray TVs and communal, com computer monitors, and I could see those tiny little flickers. Fluorescent lights just make me crazy. I mean, the fact that I have a brain injury doesn't help it any either, but it really, really can set people off. And so some of them, you have to make sure you don't have fluorescent lights where you're going. Auditory is that whole sound thing. Like I can hear things that nobody else can hear. And I was with a friend one time in her car and I'm like, how can you listen to your radio like that? She goes like, what? I said, it's off station. And she stops for a minute. She listens, she's kind of got her ear almost on the radio. It's like, you're supposed to be driving, like, can you get your head back up? <laughs> and it finally turned out that she could hear this tiny, tiny bit of static that I could hear, like, it was really like, <sighs> to me, and it was just this little thing, so quiet that she almost didn't hear. It. And then she just turned the knob a slight bit and it tuned in and I was fine. So I hear things that other people don't. And some things there's I, I've heard, I wish I'd never, ever heard. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, so now we talk about gustatory and olfactory. Um, does anybody out there in the audience know what gustatory is? Send the answer in the chat if you know. <laughs> I'm going to keep an eye on it and see if anybody is able to answer. Okay, well, I'll go to olfactory for a minute and then we'll see if anybody was able to answer the gustatory. Now, olfactory is the sense of smell. And I'm, I love garlic, but boy, am I hypersensitive to the smell of garlic. I was working with some, what do they call them now? Educational assistants, I think they're called now. And they'd been to lunch and whatever, and they're, for, for whatever reason, people like to be at the back of the room, you know, even if there's only eight of them, they all have to be at the back. They can't be at the front with me. I, I have no idea why, but, and I'm like, did you guys have Caesar salad for lunch? And this one lady goes, oh, my God, how did you know? I said, oh, I can smell the garlic. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And she's hiding her face. And I'm like, no, no. It's, I said, remember when I was talking about oversensitivity? I said, there it is. That's the hypersensitivity right there with the olfactory is I can smell stuff. And have you ever noticed what's inside the front door of a department store? Like when you're coming from a mall into the department store on the, the main front... floor? What, what's the first thing you see? I I can't think uh perfume exactly <laughs> oh good it's i've I... so just so over... the audience knows we didn't pre-plan that that actually was my guess <laughs> i had to think about so the last time i was in a department store yeah i like i run through like this you know 
face covered up. He's like, one day I'm going to get arrested because they're going to think I did something because my face is covered. I'm running to a store. But it's because the smells are so overpowering, like Axe cologne. I swear I can smell that stuff a mile away. Yeah. And my sister was wearing perfume one day and I looked at her and I'm like, why are you wearing Axe cologne? She goes, it's not Axe cologne. It's perfume. And I've been told it smells very, very good on me. So, you know, of course, I got the whole sister look and you know the all the comments and stuff and then her best friend says to her why are you wearing axe cologne <laughs> okay so it wasn't just you <laughs> no it wasn't just me but it was pretty hilarious but my sister was not impressed yeah okay did anybody come up with gustatory uh uh yes if this is the correct one we've got a uh, taste yes sense of, sense of taste and yeah. how things feel in your mouth like some people really like hamburgers with potato chips on them because it gives them that extra crunch. Mm -hmm. Now, generally at the, at the, at a point, this point in my presentation, I will ask people if there's certain foods or textures that do not, they do not like to put in their mouth. Yeah. So I get things like tapioca, you know, guacamole. Somebody said something once that just surprised the heck out of me, but you know, like cottage cheese. Yeah. That's, that's never going in my mouth again. Mm -hmm. I used to love cottage cheese, but it's a texture now that yeah, just, just doesn't work for you. Oh, no, not at all. And yet, if it's in lasagna, I'll eat it. Okay. But I can't eat it by itself anymore. Just mm -hmm. so everybody has problems with some of these, and you know, everybody has quirks. So we've all got some of these things, but for most of you, it doesn't get in the way of your day to day living. And that's mm -hmm. when it becomes the syndrome or the disorder that they speak of because it stops you from being able to live, quote, a a usual life. I don't, I don't yeah. like the word normal because it's only a setting on a dryer. So I very rarely use yeah. it. <laughs> I, uh, I, I use the word uh, typical. Yeah, that's typical. a good word. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't like normal either. What even is no, normal? <laughs> no. And we have trouble sitting too long with, without activity, unless we we're hyper-focused on something and then we forget to get up. Like when I do my bark carving, like that spirit trace you saw, I can sit there for four and five hours and carve, not realize how much time has gone and then go to stand up and go, oh, I guess it should have moved a little bit earlier. Yeah, but got to you... stretch the legs. We've got some leg cramps and. <laughs> yeah. So if you've watched me, you've noticed I probably haven't sat still the entire time I've been doing this presentation. And normally I'd be on the stage and I'd be pacing back and forth and you guys would have to, you know, it'd be like watching a ping pong game, but just, just with Terry, nobody else there. <laughs> okay. We have difficulty coping with change. Everybody hates change, but it's really, really hard for people on the spectrum, because especially Aspies, because we have this, you can't see where I'm pointing anyways, we have this <laughs> rigid adherence to rule guided behavior. So once we know what the rules are, we wanna live by those rules. Those rules keep things in line for us and in order. We have so little control over what goes on in our lives that okay, it's like, okay, I've got a rule for this. I'm gonna follow this rule. So change, you know, I can give you an example from my own life. I was working as an assistant controller at a company and I come in one Monday morning and they'd move me from my small enclosed office into a shared office with didn't even have cubicle walls or anything up. I just about lost it. Like I was so close to crying and walking out and it took me over a week to get over that. It might have been better had they prepared me for it, but they just did it. And with some people, you can you can prepare them, you know. Depending on their level of functioning, you might have to start four weeks ahead of time and go, you know, on such and such a day, we're going to be moving from this group home to this group home. And then every other day until it gets to the last week, you remind them. And then the last week you remind them every day, but other people, you have to tell them on the fly. Oh, by the way, we're moving now. Because they, they cannot handle the stress that builds up in them if they know too soon what's going to go on for them. So we don't generalize well to new situations. So what we're taught in one area, we have to be taught in the same kind of situation somewhere else. So how you behave at home in the living room, you know, if you've got company over, should be how you behave at somebody else's house. And most kids get this, you know, especially when they've been talked to a time or two by mom and dad. We don't understand that because our brains are wired so differently. And what happens is, is we get to a new situation, so we don't think to apply those rules. So, so we have to be taught again and again and again. And, you know, and parents and teachers and coworkers get 
and caregivers and stuff get exceedingly frustrated. And I'm thinking, well, if you're frustrated, come on over here for a yeah. little bit <laughs> and see how it feels like on this side. Like there's this great thing I saw on Facebook and I really need to get the t-shirt. It says, don't walk a mile in my shoes, live 30 minutes inside, 30 seconds inside my brain and that'll totally freak you out. <laughs> And it is. Yeah, it's, I feel like that shirt would be a good fit. <laughs> yeah, it would, you know, and it's it's so it's hard to explain to people how it is that we live and what goes on for us. One of the things I guess I can sort of help think of all the stars like in the galaxy, not just in our solar system, but in the galaxy. And sometimes that's about as many thoughts as are going through our head at one time. So can you imagine all of that going on up there and somebody says to, says to you, okay, you need to go sit down on the couch and behave. What, what, do, what does that mean, right? Behave like you would at home. <laughs> well, I am, and apparently that's an issue. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't do it that way. So it's, yeah. It, it's so Terry, what I, yeah, what I heard in that too, is that repetition is really helpful. You have to repeat it because more often yeah. than not, we won't get it the first time unless it's like a, an intellectual learning thing, like from school or university or something like that. We seem to catch on to that intellectual stuff a lot better than the social things. So yeah, re repetition, you know, Polly wants a cracker, Polly wants a cracker, Polly wants a cracker. Shut up, Polly, you're going to get more in a cracker in a minute. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes that's just how it works. Okay, we have trouble with big picture thinking. We get focused on details. So what what will happen when you say given a, a child an assignment or an employee an assignment and they have to prepare something for the bosses or for the teachers is we get so hung up on having that main thesis statement being absolutely perfect. We spend all of our time doing that and then the rest of it doesn't get done because you're hung up on getting that one thing right. So things will get in late or they won't get in at all, or you'll get the thesis statement and that's all you'll get <laughs> because we need to have those tiny, tiny details. We want them to be perfect. And when we're perfectionists, I mean, I'll be the first one to tell you that I am, but I'm also lucky in that I can see the big picture as well as the little details. And that's why for me, accounting was so good because I could see how everything meshed together and how what we did over in this department would affect what happened over here, which then affects, you know, what's going on up here. A lot of us can't, we get stuck on that, you know, like that little ant, it's like, oh, and where's that ant gonna go? Meanwhile, you're sitting on a big hill of them and they're crawling all over you because <laughs> you you're watching one of them beside you. Um, we have poor fine motor control and visual motor integration. Have you ever looked at the writing of somebody who has Asperger's syndrome and autism spectrum disorder? See, Terry, you and I only ever communicate over email, so it's typing. I haven't seen your, your printing. Oh, oh yeah, um, it's worse than doctor's writing. Most oh. kids with, with ASDs or um, Asperger's syndrome, they just cannot write clearly. And yet, if you put a computer in front of them, it's it's great. And for me, I think it's a far better way to teach these kids because then they can at least get their ideas down and their ideas across and they can show you that they're learning. Whereas if you're trying to teach them cursive, which nobody seems to teach anymore anyways, okay. so much for the good old days, um, th they can't do it. It's just horribly, horribly messy, like, and, and doing math, like trying to read their numbers. I remember trying to correct some kids' papers when I was here, I was teaching and kind of going, what on earth? Does that, you know, and holding the paper sideways and hoping that would help me <laughs> determine what it was they had yeah. said, but no, we're really bad about blurting out answers and interrupting. Um, I still interrupt. I try really hard not to, but I get really excited about some things, right? So I want to share and it's like, and I get going, it's like, Terry, quit interrupting so I can, I can pull myself back for a little bit, but then I get excited again because it's something I really want to share or, and it's, so it's a con for me at times, it's this real constant push and pull thing. You know, I feel a bit like a yo-yo in a conversation sometimes because <laughs> I want to get involved in the conversation, but I also know that when I'm nervous and I get into a conversation, I wind up talking about me and not what other people want to talk about you know one is as fascinating as i think i am i may not that be that way to everybody so they don't want to hear all about me you know but i have learned that people like to talk about themselves so if i'm in a situation where i'm i'm uncomfortable and i don't really know how to make small talk because i don't i it's it's one of those things that seems to come so easily to other people and 
I still struggle. I'll just say, so how many kids do you have? Oh yeah, and what do they do? And so I let them go on and, and talk about themselves and their family and stuff. So at least yeah. I, I'm pretending like I know how to fit in. And that's what having an ASD and, or Asperger syndrome, whichever one of those ones you want to call it, living is like you have to live, you have to pretend like you fit in. And sometimes I fool y'all really good and you all think I do, but still I feel like that square peg trying to be shoved into a round hole. And so Terry, yes. was that an example of, of the masking? So it was in a social situation, you've learned to what kind of questions to ask, but you really yeah. want to talk about something else? <laughs> oh yeah, much, much yeah. more so. Because I, I think the things I do are far more, in, but I mean, at the same time, it's kind of cool to listen to parents talk about their kids, especially when their kid is somebody who has an ASD and they've done something that, you know, mom and dad are particularly proud of. Those yeah. are the things I really like to hear. And um, one of the things that I talk to about parents, especially, but also to teachers, but when I'm talking and they're talking about, but everybody sees my kid so different and he does this and it's really different and he sticks out and I'm like, you know what? Embrace that difference make a big deal of it like that is so cool that you know so much about dinosaurs like you know what i bet you your friends don't know that much about dinosaurs they may because he's been talking about it but mm -hmm. if you embrace that uniqueness in your child or in your student in your coworker, you know wherever you know this person from if you say it's okay that you're like that then mm -hmm. they're going to be okay with that and they are not going to feel like such a stranger in an alien land. Because if you read a lot of the materials and you talk to people, they feel like they're living on a planet that's not welcoming to them. Mm -hmm. So if we can embrace who they are and say, you know what, that part of you was really cool and I wished I could do that like you do, then the kid's like, really? Oh, wow. So yeah. then it, it, it changes the way they look at themselves and then you don't have that big, you're still going to struggle with anxiety and depression because that's just part of it, but it's not going to be as big a struggle. And they're going to see that they are a good person because if you're told often enough that, you know, you're the devil's spawn, you never should have been born, like, why are you here? You're a bad kid. You know, pick any one of like a hundred rude things like that people can say. You start to believe that and you wonder yourself, well, then why am I here? You know, and that. At six or seven years of old age, you shouldn't feel like you're you're ready to to be done with with living. It's, you know. Yeah. So when so, we validate and embrace the uniqueness and the special interests of of those, then they are more likely to embrace it themselves and and well, mask exactly. less. Exactly. Yeah. And and so many of these unique things for these children and these adults is they can, their special interests can turn into jobs. If you go into the IT department of any company, I bet you at least 50% of them have Asperger syndrome because mm -hmm. you don't have to socialize to fix a computer, mm -hmm. but you know how they work. Yeah. So we have body space issues. I know this is like totally apropos, apropos of what we've been talking about, like nowhere near it, but this is just the slide order. So we think nothing of coming like right into your body space. And I mean, right in like, you know, what, like nose to nose, almost thing, almost, you know, when a kid would think of a kid who's following the teacher around and practically got his hand in her back pocket because he's so close. Yet, if you come into our body space, it's like not happening. And our body space can be as big as the room that we're in. So one of the things you can teach adults, kids, whatever age person about body space is you can use things like hula hoops, cardboard boxes, or, you know, just put your arms straight out to the side and say, okay, this is my space. You know, if I turn around like this or like this, you can't come inside this space. You have a space that side, so nobody can go in your space. Mm -hmm. So we have to be taught these things. We don't inherently learn them like most other children do. We have real problems with expressions of affection. Um, most of us, well, well, let's say some, I don't want to make a real sweeping generalization, but there's a lot of them who do not. I personally, if I am really hurting and if I'm crying and stuff, most people's first reaction, especially a mom's reaction, is to go hug that child and say, everything's going to be okay, give them a kiss on the cheek or kiss their scratched knee or whatever and, and make it all better. But it's like, don't touch me. 
if I want a hug from you, I will ask for a hug from you. And there's a couple of people in my life that I will hug them almost every time I see them. But I mean, I don't even do that with my mom because I'm just, I'm not that comfortable with touch. And everybody's like, you should go get massages. They'd be so good and relaxing for you. I said, well, maybe if I could handle being touched, they'd be relaxing, but otherwise, no, I don't think a massage would do me any good. So we really struggle with that, or it can go to the other extreme where you're practically hanging off somebody and some, some children will do that. And unfortunately, you will see that same kind of thing in the workplace too, which is completely inappropriate. And yet trying to explain that to them is um, they don't, they don't understand it. They don't get it unless you've got somebody who's at work prepared to be like a mentor for them or be their job coach and say, okay, this is why this is inappropriate. Um, if you want us to learn about inappropriate behaviors or things that we may have said that people find offensive or whatever, you're best to tell us in the moment. So for those of you who are listening that, you know, you an anonymous people out there, if you take nothing home from tonight, but you take one thing, please take this and that's teach us in the moment. So if I've done something to hurt you or to offend you, or if I've done something inappropriately inappropriate, you need to tell me about it now. Don't wait for three minutes from now, because I won't even know what I did, let alone why it's inappropriate. And sometimes I may not know why it has been inappropriate. So you can ask me questions to help get me there. Or if I'm just not getting it, you just have to come out and say, Terry, that was really inappropriate, inappropriate to tell, call that guy a, a bleeping blah, 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 just because he cut in front of you in line. Well, why? Because he was really rude. Yes, but you were even more rude because of what you said to him kind of things like, oh, okay. I guess I get right. that. Yeah. So sometimes we have to be told, but we need to know in the moment. And yeah. Um, oh, Terry, sorry, to, sorry yep. to interrupt you. Here I am interrupting where it says right there on the slide but um i just know as we were preparing for this presentation that you you would appreciate um there was just a note from the audience uh this is so me right down to the master's thesis perfection struggle a nose that can detect a slight gas leak that even the bubble gas detector can't initially find and feeling out of place around other people yeah so there's so much value in you sharing your story and your experience and and uh these helpful um tips and tricks because just again it helps us all embrace our own uniqueness and uh the more we share and and disclose the more people we meet that have similar experiences and then they get validated and to whoever that was thank you for sharing because i know that that's really hard to make yourself vulnerable that way mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing that with us um maybe if you get some more comments like that if you want to give me like a, a tea like a timeout tea then i'll yeah, see you do I that can, for me and, and i can do that Alrighty, then so I don't have to feel rude interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm on a roll and I go. Yeah. Okay, what you'll often see, and this could be like around a water cooler, it doesn't have to be on the playground or whatever. I, it says all on alone on a schoolyard, but that's just an example. Like you'll see like this big circle of people, right? And there's this one kid or one adult if you're around the coffee cooler and having, you know, coffee chat, and they look like they're part of the circle, but they're not. They're just sort of they're sort of there in the front and that'll be your person with an asd especially like the people with asperger syndrome because they want to have friends but they don't know how because they don't get those unwritten rules that we will talk about after a while so i also call that on the outside looking in because you you are looking in at something you want so it's like you're standing there you know with the neighbors she just made this pie you can smell this pie and oh my goodness you want a piece of that pie and there you are on the other side of the window and not getting any of that pie <laughs> kind of thing so in some ways i suppose if i wanted to think about it life life as an aspie could be like that because you're constantly looking at something or for something that you want for yourself and you have no idea how to attain that it's like, okay, I can't just reach out and grab it because it's like, you just kind of get your hand there. and It's gone. It's, you want it to be tangible, but it's not, it's really ethereal. And you're, you're, so you really struggle and try to figure out where you can fit into all this. Okay. One of the things too, that's a struggle is, and some of this is typical teenage boy, but some of this is a real issue is personal hygiene and looking after yourself. Like this one little girl, it took them six months to get this little girl to brush her teeth. 
and they couldn't figure out why they tried different toothbrushes, different toothpastes, different kinds of toothpaste, like the gel and then the foam things and then just the regular paste and the flavored stuff and the non flavored stuff. And they finally figured out it was the texture of one of the kinds of toothpastes that they kept buying for her. Mm. So she wouldn't brush her teeth because she couldn't stand all that couldn't stand that in her mouth. So that's one of those tactile things that, you know, the gustatory things. It's just like, yeah, that's not going in my mouth. A lot of times you'll hear inappropriate language comments or volume. I know I can be really loud. And when I catch myself doing it, I try to, to bring myself down. But when I get really excited, I get loud. I know I get loud. Part of that is I used to work with cadets and I can make myself heard across across a parade ground. So, you know, you kind of have to be allowed to work with cadets, but and you that's a skill be... sometimes, a skill and a value. When you need to get the attention of a room, you need oh, somebody I, who's loud. I can loud. do that. <laughs> I can do that, you know, but also sometimes I get so, um, I don't know if scared is the, the right word. And if I try and tell people I get shy, sometimes they go, yeah, right. Like you're never shy, Terry. <laughs> I'm like, no, really, I can be. And they're like, yeah, nobody ever believes that. But it is almost like a type of shyness because I get so quiet because I don't know how to react in that situation. I don't know what to say. I don't know who to say what to. So I just kind of, you know, and at five foot nine, I, it's not like I can just hide into the walls somewhere. <laughs> I kind of stick out. So it's, it's really hard. And so sometimes I do, I feel really incredibly shy, but I don't know how to get beyond that. Now, here's another audience participation question. Who, if anyone knows what the hobnail boot approach is? All right, I'm going to keep an eye on the yeah, chat and that see. Percolate for a bit. So while Hob you guys are percolating on this. Boot. Yeah, hobnail boot approach. So while everybody's percolating on this, I would like you all to stand up. And unfortunately, I can't see you. So wherever you are at home, stand up for a couple minutes, please. This is one way I can get you into the brain of somebody with, with an ASD. And I want you to start flapping, beat your hands, your fingers, your arm, your whole body, whatever. And there's probably not people to look at you. You ought to see people when I do this in a room of 50 people. And there's some boy in grade <laughs> 12 at the back of the gym trying to not look like trying to be nonchalant. And I'm going, I can see you and you are not flapping. And he'll stand there and I'm like, I'm going to keep picking on you until you start and finally he starts, right? But so are any of you out there really flapping or are you just thinking, no, I'm not doing that even if I'm home alone? <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. The reason I have you do this is there was one time one of the teachers telling me she had a little boy in her classroom who's probably grade one, grade two, maybe grade three. He flapped for six hours. Okay, if you guys are really doing this, you can sit down now. I was going to say, Terry, how long are you going to have them doing that for? We're going to tire okay. all the audience out. <laughs> yeah, well, when I have a room full of teachers, they sometimes they have to do that, do it for two or three minutes. Yeah. And it really helps put into perspective for them what's going on for, for, that, for that little guy, you know? And it's usually the little boy because the little girl will have learned to mask and not do stuff that draws attention to herself. So she may be stimming in another way, you know, she might be playing with her pencil. She might be doodling, but she's doing it very quietly. Her head's down. She, she does. She's kind of like this, you know, doesn't want anybody to see her. And I think back, you know, also it just occurred to me now that when I do my homework and stuff, that's how I used to do it. My, my nose was practically on the paper and it's like, I was hiding myself because I didn't want anybody to see what I was doing. And even though I always did well at school and most of your ASPEs will, I didn't ever think it was good enough because I didn't get validation from home. And I was that kid in the class who, if I got 99, I was not happy about it. I wanted to know what I had done to miss that 1%. Yeah. And it doesn't endear you to the other students when you're going, yes, 99. And they're like, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, how to win friends and influence people. No. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately we didn't have any takers on the on the hobnailed boot approach so i think we're we're waiting for you to share you're, you're waiting for that well so here, here's the thing with this and i've done this a couple of times what this is is this goes way back when to roman times and um the old days of scotland 
and the and the Romans wore leather sandals, and they usually had three or four layers of leather, sometimes more, and they put these hobnails hobnails in, which are really thick, heavy nails, because they were forever marching and tramping on the roads, so it would save the boots from wearing down as much. But they're also really heavy, so it's kind of hard to do anything dainty or, you know, without being clumsy in them. So uh, the hobnailed boot approach that we take to life is like we're just going in full bore, you know, bull in a china shop. <laughs> and sometimes what I do with this is I don't go back and I don't tell people what this is. Because think about everything that I've taught, told you so far, knowing that I'm going to be talking for another, what, another, another hour? Uh, no, we've got Ooh, another hour. 35 okay. minutes. Yeah. Okay. So think about everything I've told you so far. That's the only thing you don't get, right? Now, if this, if you were an Aspie, that might be the only thing you get out of everything that we've talked about so far. So it's people kind of go, oh, and this one lady kept going. I don't get it. Like, and she was getting mad and everybody's <laughs> like, that's exactly the point. You're not supposed to get it. Mm -hmm. She's trying to help you get in the head of somebody with Asperger syndrome. So we're going to go through these next ones fast. Okay, bullying. I'm going to, I know that um, the behind the scenes manager here who's doing all of our tech stuff is going to send you guys these PowerPoints uh, so that you can read through them. I want to get to the tips and the tools because I have a tendency to, to go on and on. And I like it much better when I have a big clock because then I can sort of keep an eye on the time. Yeah, I'm trying my best to be to be your clock, but yeah. <clears throat> so people who are different, and I don't care what kind of difference it is, whatever kind of difference you are, you are going to get picked on and you're going to get bullied. And it doesn't matter how big you are, because when I was in grade nine, I was five foot nine, 160 pounds, and I still got picked on by littler people because I was different. And sometimes you'll see it in the workplace. Like workplace is a horrendous for bullying. And it's 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 just they, that they do it differently and they're a little bit more sophisticated about how they do it. You know, they don't just come up and punch you in the face. They they take verbal jabs at you or they say things to try and demean you or to mean demean your work behind your back. So yeah, it's, it's always one kid that gets picked on. So this talks more about bullying. So there's passive targets, the ones who are really, they're weaker, they're shy, they have low self-esteem, they're solitary, they're academic. I, I was some of that. And then I was also some of the proactive because I was irritating and provocative. I was socially clumsy. I was inappropriate. I was attention seeking. <laughs> so, you know, there's passive, there's proactive, and then there's Terry who wants to have a little bit of everything. <laughs> So you, when you guys get your PowerPoint and you want to know more details about the bullying, please feel free to read it because there's a lot of info in there. Okay, often comorbid with ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, Tourette's Disorder. And when I'm talking Tourette's, I'm talking about the movement part of the disorder, not the, you know, the, the random outbursts of swearing and the animal noises and stuff like that. That's actually a very rare form of Tourette's. It's, it's not something that's common, but it's more of a movement disorder. NLD, which is nonverbal learning disability, does not mean they can't talk. They can talk, but they have, there's a disconnect between their brain and the paper with language arts and with math. And they know the stuff, but they can't seem to get it on paper. But if you ask them orally, then they can give you the answer. And you can get some OCD. For me, I have, <clears throat> so I have Asperger syndrome and, Anxiety and depression just comes with that, whether you want it or not. So I've got Asperger syndrome, anxiety, depression. I've got ADHD. I've got some Tourette's tics. I've got some OCD straight tra traits, straights. Um, I don't have the NLD, but yeah, so I have some of that stuff. And it's like, man, I was on a bad karma train or something one day. Our OCD <laughs> is often related to sensory issues, right? You know, and like, I feel like. I used to cut my hair really, really short, like to the point of it, like being maybe an inch tall, because sometimes I feel like my skin is just crawling, especially on my head. It's not so bad at this length, but if it gets longer than it is, it just, oh. And if you see me rubbing my head like this, it means I'm getting wound up and the aspie is about to come out. <laughs> Usually I can keep a bit of control, but. So for me, Asperger syndrome is like a train, it's the engine. Then we have the ADHD. 
for those of you who are old enough, I know one of you is, will remember this, Barb, I'm sure, um, that you will, the old grain silos, you'd pull up with the empty box car and then it would open, the spout would open and then whatever grain they happen to be transporting across the prairies would open up and they'd fill this box car full of wheat. The next one might be a wheat or it might be rye or it might be canola. So that's to me what I think of these as, is I picture one of these, you know, these old frames, you know, going up to the grain silos, which I don't think they use anymore, the grain elevators. So, and then there's the turret. I think I missed one back up. How do I back up again? Yeah, the one okay, we, OCD. Yeah, there you go. Tourette's and other movement disorders. So I've got that. I've got the generalized anxiety disorder and the depression. I don't have nonverbal learning. There's a sensory processing disorder that you can get with this. There's so many things that become comorbid with Asperger syndrome and autism spectrum disorders, not to mention other mental health issues and physical health issues. Like sometimes it just runs the gamut and you get so many things. Everybody get time to read that? <laughs> I've got to throw a little levity in here because this stuff gets pretty heavy after a bit. Yeah. Okay, hopefully we're getting to the, okay. I'll go through these quickly. I have a lot of parents, teachers, caregivers, um, not, not coworkers so much. I mean, at times I have had them ask, but they ask about labels. And I think labels are really important, especially when the child is young. Because unfortunately it comes down to, if you've got a label, you're gonna get the almighty buck. So then you're going to get the money to get your child the supports that they need. Or as they're starting to realize that, hmm, adults still need support, some of them. So, okay, yes, they have this label. Okay, what can we do to help this person with the label? Whereas if you have not been labeled and you just say, well, I need these accommodations or I need these kinds of supports, they're not going to give them to you. So as much as labels are not always nice and not everybody likes to be labeled, if we want help, we need to have the label. Medications. Now, um, when you're over 18 and you know you don't have to worry about a public trustee or a guardian and you're able to, to do your own thing, medications are purely a, a personal choice. When you're younger, it's talks with mom and dad and the school and the pediatrician and what's the best for my child, what's not best for my child. I personally take a lot of medications, but they enable me to live the quality of life I know I deserve to live. Mm -hmm. And the person I am when I'm on medications is like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde compared to when I'm not on meds. And I didn't like that person. And there's days that I forget to take my meds. I haven't in a long time, but I know it that day. And so does everybody else around me. And one of my closest friends said to me, yes, I, I recall that day, day, Terry. And we we don't want one of those anytime soon. <laughs> it's, it's just really bad. Like most things, like I take antidepressants. And for most people, it takes several weeks of being off antidepressants before you will notice that difference. Not with me. You'll notice it that same day. Okay, here we go. Now, dates for alien living. These were the tips and tools. And one day I tried to say AIDS for daily living. That is not how it came out. This is how <laughs> it came out. Dates for alien living. So these are your tips and tools. And if we're talking about alien living, you've got to have the requisite skinny green guy, right? It's just, it's just part of being an alien. And because so many of us with autism spectrums and disorders, Asperger syndrome, whatever you choose to call it, feel like we're aliens living on a strange planet, this works perfectly. It's funny how all of this just kind of meshed together just from a few ideas floating around in the air. So the biggest thing I can say as a, as a tip for parents, for coworkers, for bosses, for caregivers, for professionals, you know, quit taking it personally. So Q-tip, it's not about you. It's about the person you're dealing with who's struggling to try and explain something to you or they're having some sort of tactile issue or something's going on. I used to run around, I could have a shirt with a tag on it and be fine with it for years. And then all of a sudden one day it would just make me crazy. And my friend would take out this minuscule pair of scissors and snip, 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 and cut the tag off because I just couldn't deal with it. <laughs> so another thing you can do that really makes a difference is present clear visual cues. So take real life pictures of the steps for somebody to do something. 
And the age of digital photography is fantastic for this. And if you can get a picture of them doing something that you've asked them to do and they're doing it correctly, it is so awesome. And then what you can do, you know, depending on if you're in a school or the type of workplace you're in and the type of task it was, you can maybe put a picture up on the bulletin board and then the next week do something for a different employee who does not have a disability or is not different in the way that we are. And so that everybody gets recognized for doing something. And then you don't, then the individual doesn't stick out as much. So one of the things I say to teachers that you can do is if you're, Every kid has a special interest. So give, you know, one, one day a week, five minutes, one kid gets five minutes to talk about a special interest. Then the next week, it's somebody else. Then the next week, it's somebody else. So every kid will get to talk about their special interest, but they're not singled out. Whereas if you have this kid talking din dinosaurs, you know, the whole day long, he's, he sticks out. But if everybody gets a chance, like some little girl will probably be madly in love with Barbie dolls and want to tell you about her Barbie dolls, okay? And then you got this other little boy that likes matchbox toys. I used to, we used to call them dinky toys. Let me tell you things that I used to say when I was a kid, you can't say anymore because people just get, well, what? I mean, they just don't sorry. know what it is. <laughs> well, but either that or they take offense to it. It's like, no, just nothing like that, <laughs> you know? Um, use verbal or physical cues. Avoid abstract concepts. Like if you want me to get something for you that's say on a shelf in a classroom, please make sure you tell me where the bookshelf is, which bookshelf the book's going to be on, the title of the book, and if you know what, maybe the color of the book so I know exactly where to go get it. Don't say, I want the book, you know, John walks home in the rain, it's in my classroom. Well, that's pretty big and your classroom is pretty big. We need to have stuff broken down into steps and they have to be repeated. We talked earlier about meltdowns, um, what you can do at work, at school, at home, is if you can see that on a scale of one to five, somebody's at about a two and a half or a three, it's like, okay, what plan have we got in place here so that we can stop it? Let's, let's, let's call it one to 10, that gives us a bit more room. So if we're at a six and we can see that it's happening, what do we what can we do to stop it getting to an eight? Because if you wait till it's an eight, you're not going to get it done before the kid hits the 10, the kid, the adult, um, whoever, it's just not going to happen. And if somebody is having a meltdown, don't try and stop it because you're just going to make it worse and it'll probably last longer. So let them finish. Hopefully you can get them somewhere. So maybe it's not quite as noticeable, but you know, Life happens, right? And that's just, that's part of our lives. So you kind of go with it where you can. So um, what I say is move the student or it could be the adult to a safe place or with a safe person. And um, when I say safe person, I mean somebody that the, the, adult, the worker, like maybe the worker has a mentor on the job and they're really, really close to this mentor and they haven't let anybody else get close to them, you know, cause we put up walls because we're different. We don't want anybody to get in there and hurt us any more than they already do. So if they have this mentor or this special coworker that they have a good relationship with, get them with this individual and take them to a quiet place so they can sort of just calm down and bring themselves from that level seven back down to a three so that we don't get the whole point, you know, to that point where we're actually going to have the meltdown. And then try and get them to explain to you what it is that's going on. And if they can't put it in their own words, maybe ask them questions that will help them and you understand what it was so that you can possibly avoid that trigger again in the future. And sometimes when I really struggle, I try and think what it was that triggered me. And some days, not a clue. I will just will not be able to understand what it was that triggered me. And so I can't avoid the situation because don't know what the trigger was. <laughs> So, and Carol Gray writes these things called social stories. They're great for kids, but I think you can also, if you change the language in them a bit, gear them towards adults as well. And they're just stories of how to deal with situations and inappropriate behaviors that may have occurred. And like you can teach them ahead of time so that sometimes you can avoid some of these situations that we would wind up in. Mm -hmm. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Um, avoid idioms, double meaning, sarcasm, and teasing, you know, like bear with me. Don't ever say that to a kid because you just don't know what that kid's going to do. <laughs> Be really concrete. And so this is like just saying avoid abstract concepts in a different way. 
break things down into as small steps as you can, so you can explain them in more than one way. When I was teaching music to grade seven students, I was trying to teach them the concept of the length of notes. So I had an apple. I said, so this apple here is equal to a whole note. And a whole note is equal to four beats because we're talking four four time. So I said, this is four beats, it's a whole note. Okay. And I cut it in half. And I'm going, so what do I have? And they're going, well, you have two halves of an apple. Like they're looking at me like I've got rocks in my head, you know, like you're kind of weird here. <laughs> and I said, okay, so, but so then each half apple is equal to half a half note. So two half notes are equal to one whole note, which is equal to four beats. So I've got a half note and a half note. If I put them together, what do we get? And they're going, and it takes a little bit, but then they go, oh, you got a whole note. And I'm like, exactly. So we have two half apples. So you cut each apple, half of an apple in half again. So you get four quarters. And I'm like, okay, so we have two quarters. If I put them together, what do you get? And then they're like, we get half an apple. I said, exactly. So it's a half note. So two quarter notes equals a half note. And then, you know, we do the same thing with the other two. And then we make four. And I take it down to eighth notes, because which is generally the smallest note kids in grade seven will play. So bonus is they learn a totally different way, a visual way, a tactile way to learn to count music, to understand how long those notes are. Plus the bonus is they all get a piece of apple when they're done. <laughs> <laughs> they get a delicious snack. Exactly. So you have to break it down into steps. Even for somebody as old as me, sometimes things need to be broken down into the into really small steps. Now you may not need to go not need to go down quite as in depth with an adult, but you may also have to as well. But that's the easiest way for us to get it. And then give us that sheet that has those steps printed out because we're not going to remember them a half an hour from now, let alone tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so use your special interest to engage the child. So the kid's thrilled about dinosaurs. So you say, okay, if you've got five dinosaurs on one side of the hill and they take a walk and they come upon four dinosaurs on the other hill, how many dinosaurs do you have? So you can start teaching them math. You can teach them social studies because you use that special interest to get them to start learning and then you move them off onto the other things that you want them to learn. So you can do that with adults too, because depending on the functioning of some of the adults, that's where they're at. Because you meet one person with Asperger's syndrome, you only meet one person with, with Asperger's syndrome. We're like snowflakes that way. And no, I'm not saying we're flaky. I'm just saying we're all very, very different. Share some uh -huh. of the similar traits. So give the child opportunities to display their special knowledge. I've talked about how you share that throughout the class. So everybody gets the opportunity to be special. There's games that you can use to recognize facial expressions. And I've got these posters and they say, how do I feel today? And good grief, there's like 200 pictures on two posters. And I'm like, seriously, the human face can do that many. Oh my God, you know, no wonder I can't figure out what people are saying by their face. <laughs> yeah, totally out there for me. So creating healthy boundaries like side hugs, you know, high fives, keep that, you know, space appropriate. Because especially in today's day and age, when so many things have happened to children over the years, you have to be really, really careful. And always when you're working with these kids, with these adults, you know, keep it positive. You know, I really like it when you follow all of these steps and you've complete, you complete this task. Because you know what? I've never seen these shelves look any neater than you make them. And it's because you're following all of those steps. Like, awesome, you know? And my favorite way to let someone know that I think they did a really good job is to give them a high five. How do you feel about high fives? All right, high five, low five, you know, whatever, whatever you can, you know, come up with that works for both of you. Okay, learning right and wrong means experiencing concrete examples. So we have to know the difference between right and wrong. We need to know that if I do something right, I can get a reward. If I don't, if I do something that is considered wrong, depending on what it is, you know, you may or may not get a little swat or a talking to or just, a, okay, you know, this is inappropriate because, you know, and in the workplace, unfortunately, if you do the same thing wrong too many times, you're going to get fired. And it might not be because the work was always wrong. It might just be because they don't know how to deal with you. So the best thing to do with you is to fire you, especially in that first three month period where you don't have to have a reason to fire somebody when they're under probation. You can just let them go. And that's what's really hard because then you're left going, well, what did I do wrong? And if I did do something wrong, why didn't somebody tell me about it so that I could fix it? Uh -huh. 
don't let me know what I'm doing wrong. I can't do anything to address it. And so many of us are left wondering what it is we could have done differently. And sometimes there is nothing. Sometimes they just don't quite know what to do with this. They don't know how to handle this. They don't know how to deal with us. No matter that there's a job coach there, that there's a manager you can talk to. Some people just, it's, it's a tough thing for them to be able to deal with. Um, we have a very creative and inquisitive nature. Um, you have to set expectations for us, not too low and not so high that we can't reach them just enough so that we can reach up and just barely touch that bar and go, okay, if I work a little bit harder, I can grab that bar. And then the next ex expectation goes a little bit higher because we feel good about ourselves when we, when we reach that. And part of what happens with people who have autism spectrum disorders is that the bar is, they expect that we can't do anything. So nobody sets any goals for us and we don't know about setting goals for ourselves. So we can never become more in the eyes of society if we're not given anything to do. And some of us function well enough that we can set those bars for ourselves. And sometimes we set them too high. And I know I'm at fault for doing that for myself. And I used to be really bad at expecting other people to do things as well as I did. And that's something you'll find is that people with Asperger syndrome who are fairly high functioning and got a high IQ is they have really high expectations for other people and they really brag about how smart they are. And I mean, I was like that. I was so, so bad. And it's like, you know, that could be one of the reasons not many people like you, Terry. <laughs> so you have to, and this only comes with age and with learning and having a ton of people say, you know, you're kind of an arrogant jerk. And it hurts to hear it, but then when you finally hear it and you finally see it, you kind of go, okay, so what do I need to do differently? And if you have really good friends like I do, they will say, this is what needs to change. And the people who love you will help you with that. But don't just go up to any old stranger because that won't work, but you has got to be with somebody that you love and you trust in order to be able to get that. You need clearly defined rules and consistently applied consequences like anybody else. If you if you say you're going to do something to punish me, well, then you better follow through on that because if not, I'm not going to follow the rule. Okay, we, 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 we can have almost too much positive self-esteem at times, but we have really strong internal motivation because we want it to be right every time we do it. Try and teach in a way that's meaningful to each child, to each coworker that you have, to each adult that's in whatever situation you're in, because we all learn differently. You can't just tell me how to do something. You have to show me. And then if I read about it, it helps. But I, you can't just say, well, we're going to put X, Y, and Z together, and it's going to come out looking like a, you know, um, a Ferris wheel. That's the word I was looking for. You know, if, you if I don't know what it is I'm looking at, <laughs> you know. So as a person working with somebody who has an autism spectrum disorder, be creative. You use everything that is available to you to just show them what it is that you want from them and what you expect. Them. And you can model those behaviors as well. It doesn't have to be something, you know, but it's got to be something tangible. We don't do real well with the abstract and with the, uh, the ethereal things that you just, you can't put your fingers on. That remember, pile of gray kittens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, quit taking it personally because it is not about you. You'll oftentimes hear them say for Aspies, it's not all about you, you know, but sometimes that's exactly it. It is all about me. Okay. <laughs> see, this is the, these are the parts where I really miss having the people. Yeah. Because when you yeah. can see, hear the laughter, you can see the smiles on their faces and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I'm just letting I'm you know, little... Terry, there's 10 minutes. Okay. We can get through these. Amazing. So the unwritten rules of social relationship, Temple Grandin and, oh, I thought his name was on here. Sean Barron, I think is the guy who wrote him. Okay, so this is the rules as they are in society. These, these are the ones that we don't know about because they're not written down, so we can't figure out where they are. So rules are not absolute. They're situation-based and people-based. They are, but it's really tough for us to figure that out. It's like teaching us things Every time we get into a new situation, you have to teach us the same thing. <clears throat> okay, 
not everything is equally important in the grand scheme of things. Well, some days I think it should be, but <laughs> you know, that's just not the way it is. So what we have to learn to do, and I still have to learn to, some days I have to remind myself on a daily basis that, okay, you had this one bad moment to start your day. Like maybe I dropped a glass or, you know, put the, the pot in the Keurig thing wrong or didn't put it in and wonder why I didn't get any coffee. It doesn't have to mean that that's the end of your day, you know, sometimes, but I'll have a day that'll start like that and it'll carry on for bits like, okay, I'm just going to have a, a day and, you know, everything's going to be equally as bad and I can't do anything about it. Okay, everyone in the world makes mistakes. It doesn't have to ruin your day. Sometimes it does ruin your day and it's really hard to get yourself out of there, especially if you are kind of the, the kind of person who hasn't got to the point in their life yet where they've got self-esteem and they feel good about who they are, what it is they can do, what it is they can offer to the rest of society. Even if it's just being themselves and saying, you know what, I'm different and it's okay to be different because I'm me and me is a pretty cool person. So, you know, but it's hard to get there. It, it, sometimes it's just a matter of age. Honesty is different than diplomacy. Now, I've got a story for this one. <laughs> I had a friend who, um, celiac. And she used to do all of her own baking and stuff. And I really enjoyed most of her baking. And she made muffins one day and I'd come over to the house or something. And she says, here, try one of these. She said, you know, she says, they're not as good as some others that I made. And I took a bite and I'm like, and I don't spit my food out, right? Like I just, I just <laughs> chew them. But I, and I said, these are the most disgusting muffins I've ever tasted in my entire life. Well, you can imagine how well that went over. <laughs> I got the stink eye for a couple of hours, I'm sure. Yeah. And yeah. She, she makes fruitcake, which I absolutely despise. I have never liked fruitcake, but she does it differently. She doesn't buy all the candied fruit that you can buy for fruitcake. She buys the dried fruit. She washes off all the extra sugar and crap that's on it, lets it soak to get rid of all. And then she makes the, the, the batters and she does, you do whatever you do for fruitcake. I don't know, never having had the stuff, like the stuff. And she makes a light cake and a dark cake. And she says, you might want to try these just because they're different than other people. So you, so you might, you might like them. I'm like, oh man, really? So I take the first bite. I said, you know, I still think I'm not going to like fruitcake for the rest of my life. Yeah. She goes, you know, you handled that so much better than you did the muffin thing. I'm like, yeah, I know. I figured it out. I got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah, you and learned. I remember <laughs> at one of my presentations at, at the government of Alberta, somebody says to me, what did you say again? I got to get that down. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, you're in trouble at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being polite is appropriate. And yes, it is. But sometimes you just get tired of the garbage that gets thrown at you. And sometimes I just have to bite my time or turn and walk away because I know I'm going to say something rude. And it doesn't matter how rude the other person is. I have to remember, don't lower yourself there, Terry. Just walk away. But when you see the blood trailing down my chin, <laughs> you know I'm biting my tongue. Okay. So not everyone who is nice to me is my friend. And this, you know, for, for younger people, for kids, for like, people even in their mid-20s, because the male brain, the frontal lobe of the male brain does not fully develop till they're about their mid-20s. And people with Asperger's syndrome tend to be three to five years behind their peers developmentally as it is. So, and when I had my adult support group, um, one guy was just making somebody else absolutely nuts. I'm like, so what is it about him that makes you crazy? Well, he reminds me of my brother when my brother was 16. I said, bingo. He's 21 and he's acting like he's 16 because that's where his brain is. So he can't help that that's who he is at this point, right? So kids like that, so we're behind developmentally, you know, we've got all this other crap going on and people come up to us and be nice to us. Doesn't mean they're our friend. They may want to get us involved in something that we really shouldn't be involved in. So you really got to watch that. People act differently in public than they do in private. Well, we certainly wish they would sometimes, I tell you, because <laughs> if that's how they behave in public, I'd hate to see what some of them behave like in private. So yeah. we should have like, you know, a public life and a private life, but we don't. Know when you're turning people off and care. For me, sometimes the and care part is the hard part. Like if I've been having a rough day, it's like, why should I care if this person is ticking me off or, you know, if, or if what I'm doing is really bothering this person because they've been bothering me all day. 
but I have learned and I try really, really hard to to follow these unwritten rules and you do learn them over time. And I jokingly say like, you know, well, I don't care and I, I mouth off or not, but I'm really, I'm really not that way. I work extra hard at being polite when I'm out in public. And there's been times where I've really wanted to say something. And occasionally I do, like I remember one time this guy, I was right behind him and he let the glass door slam in my face. And I opened the door and I came up behind him. I said, well, nobody will ever accuse you of being a gentleman now, will they? And he looked oh. at me and I'm like, because I mean, I came like a quarter of an inch away of having this glass plate door slam in my face. So that time I, I could not keep my mouth shut. I mean, at least I didn't say any rude or nasty language, but he didn't even get it. He just kept on going. I'm like, so what was the point? Okay, so fitting in is often tied to looking and sounding like you fit in. So, surprise, you guys all think I'm a professional. Ha! Got you fooled. Because <laughs> <laughs> we do. We have to pretend that we fit in sometimes, because otherwise we don't. We stick out. And this is so, this number 10 is so important for everybody. I don't care how old they are, you know, what they've been through. You are responsible for your own behaviors. You can't say, well, my Asperger made me do it. That's the same as saying, you know, stupidity is not the reason you murdered that guy you know so i i mentored this young girl that oh she would have these huge temper tantrums like in the lobby of a like a 15 story office building and just throw herself on the floor and scream and shriek and the whole nine yards and you're like you know what when you tell people that that's your asperger syndrome i said you make the rest of us look bad and she heard that from me other people had said that to her but she wouldn't hear it from them because she knows that i walk the talk I just don't talk. So sometimes it's it's easier, but yeah. So whatever you do, you have to be responsible for. So there comes that time, that growing, that learning, that that maturing. I, you know, being mature isn't all it's cracked up to be. You know, I'm getting older. I don't know if I'm mature, but you know, got to have that inner kid that still gets out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this I'll leave you guys to to read because we've covered a lot of this stuff already. Um, we do have empathy for others, even though you can't always see it, because our faces often have a very flat affect. Sometimes we empathize too much because we've been there, done that, do not want a t-shirt. So there are some more of those things that are a problem. Okay, on the plus side, so we've got some pluses here. We have a sense of humor. It's wacky, like it's out there sometimes, but it's pretty wonderful, you know, and it we can wonderful. generally get you guys laughing. We're very, very loyal. Like if we love you, you know, picture the good old St. Bernard the keg around his neck, a little cask, and he's following you everywhere he goes, you know, like some little puppy who just got a new home. And it, we're loyal to the nth degree. Like there isn't anything I wouldn't do for my two best friends. Like they ask me, I'm there. And despite our quirks, we are very lovable. We are honest, sometimes to a fault, but we, we are honest. We have a great memory, usually for things that people wish desperately you'd forget. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, you're really not bringing that up again. Like my ex had bought tickets one time to the Edmonton Drillers soccer team. And this was like a long, long time ago when they had yeah. an indoor soccer team up here in Edmonton. And she found them the day after the game. <laughs> so about 15 years later, I'm like, man, I wish I could have gone and seen that soccer game. And she's like, oh, shut up about the damn game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's those kind of things that we remember. We enable others to see things through new eyes because we look at things differently because our brains are wired different. Okay, we have strong verbal skills, as I have indicated to you, and I've had to cut down on some of what I was going to say because I was yakking so much. We're independent, very willing to do things our own way. Sometimes we won't ask for help. We need to try and figure it out ourselves. Very persistent because we want it done and we want it done right. So one of the things I have to do as a president of Alliance Club is delegate. And for me, that's really hard to do because I like things done my way and I know I'm going to do a good job. And it's like, okay, shut off that part of your brain and give others the chance to shine, you know? And I have to think of it that way. And we're very, very diligent about what we do. Um, I'm trying to remember what the next slide is. Okay, so with the right support, we can learn, we do progress, and each of us is unique. 
And trust me, you don't want us all to be the same because that would just be too much at once anyways. <laughs> so I'd like to leave you guys with one thought before we go to the Q and A. And if you work with somebody with an autism spectrum disorder, or if you live with someone, or if you're a teacher or whatever, and you may have had like a really, really bad day in the classroom with them or a really bad appointment with them or your kids living at home and you're just like, what are you going to do? You're at your wits end. You're ready to rip your hair out. You know, you're, you, you just, you just don't know what to do. And you kind of go, oh, I have to go back and do this again. Okay. Be a brave little buckaroo. Let's go. We got to do this again. And sometimes that takes a lot of courage on your part to, to, to step up to that plate and do it all again, knowing that the day you have could be just as bad or worse than the one you had yesterday, or it could be infinitely better, but whatever it is, it still takes a lot of courage. So if it takes you as parents, caregivers, professionals, teachers, coworkers, if it takes you that much courage some days to be able to face us, imagine how much it takes us to live every minute of every day. So I'd like to leave you with this. Courage doesn't always roar. <clears throat> Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. Thank you for letting me share my story. Oh, oh. Thank you so much, Terry. You're welcome. Um, so now we uh, would love to open it up to uh, a question and answer period um, for anyone who may um, want to type in the chat or into the Q and A um, for uh, questions for Terry. Um, I think we can all uh, well definitely need to thank and acknowledge um, just your your candor and your humor. Um, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I would say there's Probably just about no question that you're unwilling to answer. No, you ask, I'll answer. I yeah, mean, because absolutely. how else are you guys going to learn? And you know what? Exactly. Sometimes I get asked questions that make me think so that I can learn something new. Yeah. So absolutely. as far as I'm concerned, the only stupid question in the world is the one unasked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first question here, um, mm -hmm. how did you manage in the world of COVID having to wear actual masks? Did it matter since you stated you don't usually read facial expressions anyways? And then also, what about the body awareness because of physical distancing? Um, oh, didn't do well with the actual having to wear a mask. Um, was that, and was that for sensory reasons or? Sensory reasons and, and the whole, like, I mean, I've got mild asthma and the whole not being able to breathe and it's always hot and, um, and I was never a masker anyways. Everything that I feel is written on my face. Like I swear virtually everybody in the world knows what I feel sometimes. It's like, what, what? But yet sometimes what you see on my face isn't congruent with what's in my head. So it's always best to ask me, but I really struggled with wearing the mask and with the physical distancing. Most of the time, if I was out, I was with my partner. So. It was okay for her and I to be close together, but we we definitely tried to stay farther away. And if I was in line and somebody kept creeping up behind me, I'd try and make myself a little bit bigger, sort of push my elbows back a little bit. And a couple of times I just said, excuse me, will you please back up? You're in my space. Yeah. And you have to do it politely, but yeah, physically the masks were just, so yeah, trying to figure out what it, I mean, I could never tell how anybody was reacting to what I was saying. Not a clue. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, for for what it is, people might as well be wearing masks all the time now, anyways. Because <laughs> right, that's exactly. how I see it. <laughs> it's kind of how I see it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question. Uh, oh, I like this one. What What did you want to be when you were growing up? Oh, what didn't I want to be? What didn't? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> what didn't you want to be? I want, I really wanted to be an architect at 1 point. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a lawyer and then I thought, no, I could not put up with the garbage that comes from being a defense counsel and trying to get those guilty guys off. If I was, a, you know, on the um, prosecution, I couldn't handle all those people lying and all the stuff that they pull and I feel like uh, there's a lot of gray gray in the legal oh, in the legal oh, world. Huge. 
At one point, yeah. I thought about going into the military, and I could have done the officer route because I have a university degree. But then I thought, no, nope, can't put up with that garbage either. And I certainly don't want somebody telling me how to do something when I know darn well I can do it better than they can. <laughs> so I kind of did all sorts of things. I've, I was a truck driver for years. I'm a certified journeyman parts person. I was, I've got some second and third um, level year level courses um, in towards a certified general accountant. I've got a music diploma. I've got my university degree. And so I kind of bounced all around and then I was working at one company working with people with disabilities and I was working as a uh, specialized learner support, like help them in school and stuff and doing job coaching. And somebody says, well, why don't you start your own company? And so I have found my niche and I've been doing this now since I was about 45 or 46. And most people with Asperger's, they can get up and they can talk for three hours, but they can't explain to you what it is like I can. They will just talk about their special interest. So, and somebody once asked me, you know, what the blessing is with this. And I'm thinking, you, you're a psychiatrist of all the people in the world. You're asking me what the blessing is with Asperger's syndrome. And then I yeah. thought, no, wait a minute. For, for me, there is one because I get to give a voice for those thousands of people who cannot speak for themselves. So I get to make a difference in a lot of people's lives and this is my niche this is where i am supposed to be this is my passion and, and terry if you, you were to def if you were to define this what is this talking to people sharing my yeah. story and saying you know what this is me in all my glory like it or not you know i i think differently than you but i am still a person i still can contribute as valuably to this society as any one of you can and i'm here to show you that there are thousands of others just like me who are also different than me but who will add value to this society and to this world this crazy crazy world that we live in <laughs> yeah Absolutely. I, I absolutely love to do it. I have missed doing it so much. Mm -hmm. So the studies helped, but I wish this could have been an in-person thing because in-person presentations are are my gig. Absolutely. Like I just yeah. love yeah. them. We can tell. Although Terry, I will say you did a fantastic job. Nobody would ever have known that this was your first ever virtual <laughs> first ever virtual. You know, my studies are good. My studies are good. I've got a lion, yeah. a llama a bird and a dog. So we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to point out a, a comment and not a question, but a comment that was made mm -hmm. in the chat. Uh, thank you. The value of lived experience is immense in understanding Asperger's. Thank you. Yeah. And that's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. So that um, people can get a little glimpse. Yeah. Interesting that you mentioned about that. Uh, you said a psychiatrist. What what's the you said something about what's the value or what's the 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 great thing about being an Aspie and that was going to be the next question. So like, what do you love most about, you know, being an Aspie? What do you love? What do you love about yourself? What do you love about, you know, we talk about some of the challenges that come along with this diagnosis, but and and I love how you added in those slides about what's what's also great about it. What do you love about it? Now that I've finally figured out, I love that I get to be me. Mm -hmm. It was a very, I mean, there was other stuff too that had gone on in my life, a lot of, a lot of trauma and stuff when I was younger and I had to work my th way through so much stuff. And it was just, I think, shortly before I started my company that I learned to love and, and more importantly, to honor who I am. Mm -hmm. So I get to be me. I love the person I've become and I'm still becoming because I never stop growing. I never stop learning. I oftentimes get asked things that make me think. I'm like, okay, let me think about that for a sec. So I get to continue to grow and learn. But I think most of the most important thing for me about being an Aspie is that I make a difference. Uh -huh. And I know that I do. And if I only made a difference to one person in the audience tonight, I've done my job. But if I made a difference for everybody, imagine the ripple effect of that. Like, oh, just just knowing that, you know, kind of gives me shivers. That it's like that. Throw that little stone in the pond, and then mm -hmm. see how far those ripples are going to go. Because somewhere Absolutely. down the road, you'll meet somebody, and you'll go, you know, 
I remember listening to a talk one day by a lady who, you know, said something about this and then you, then that person can make a difference in that other person's life. Yeah. There's uh, sometimes a little bit of a of a perception. I'll I'll use the workplace as an example. Um, you know, when someone says, you know, I had to struggle to get here, so now you have to struggle too, um, which I think is a really backwards way of thinking about I, it. But it, like it, it happens. Yeah, no, we don't like oh, it. It does. But it, but it happens absolutely. And oh. what I really appreciate is that you 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 share that you 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 did have qu quite some significant struggles. And instead of saying like, because I struggled, you have to struggle. You're like, because I struggled, I'm coming here to make this path easier. Yep. And that's, that's what I want to do, you know, and I know parents say, well, don't do this because I did that and it didn't work out very well for me. And all of us kids go, no, I have to learn on my own. Mm -hmm. And I can't take away somebody's struggle, but I can maybe help them understand it. Mm -hmm. And nobody can take away those learning opportunities. Like when I was working with the um, support group and I was dealing with their parents and stuff. And I said to the parents, I said, you're going to have to let the kids fall. And when I say kids, these were all between the ages of like 21 and 30. Yeah. And I said, you have to let them fall. I says, because otherwise they're not going to know how to get up and do for themselves when you guys are gone. And then they, then they go, well, how would when do we do that how do we know when to do that i said you'll know but you need to do it they need to uh -huh. fall and then they need to know who they can turn to you know because as mom and dads you're not going to be there forever for those kids uh -huh. and so that was that was that was harsh for them <laughs> i can tell yeah. by the look on their face they're like do you want me to do what it's like, yeah <laughs> It's like when we learned to walk, we fell how many times? It's the same yeah. thing when you're growing up with Asperger's syndrome or an autism spectrum disorder. You have to be let fall so you can figure out how to get up. Even if you have to kerfuffle around in the gravel for a little while to <laughs> figure out how to do it, you do it. Yeah. And I've got a replaced knee and I still fall. And mm -hmm. I, sometimes I absolutely forget what I'm supposed to do to get up. So I sit there for five or 10 minutes and go, okay. Now, how do I have to place this part of my body in order to be able to stand up again? <laughs> and people are like, why are you sitting there? And I'm like, because I can't remember how to get up. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'll get there. <laughs> yeah, I'll get there. So, you know, we all have to learn how to fall, but we all have to learn how to get back up too. But there's nothing wrong with saying, give me your hand. Okay. Here's my hand, take my hand, and I will help your journey. I will walk with you. I will walk beside you on this journey. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And so very, I get yeah, to do you, that. Yeah, fantastic. And you've had such a, even just when you were listing off some of the roles, like it feels almost like you've lived 15 lives, 30 lives. <laughs> some days I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just, I, I like that I've learned to be me and love me and I can make a difference. And even if people don't acknowledge that, it's okay. Because mm -hmm. I know. And that's all that matters Absolutely. is that I know. Yeah. Um, so the next question, uh, in your lifetime, was there a certain program or service that you received or participated in that you found the most helpful? Um, not so, you know, really. now, yeah, nowadays because there's, there's Lots of different now, programs there and services. Yeah, there wasn't when I was growing up, and there's still so little for adults. Mm -hmm. It it just it it makes me want to cry because it's like you've been helping kids for how many years? What are these poor kids who've had supports since they were two or three years old going to do when they hit eighteen? Because mm -hmm. it's not like there's a magic switch that says it's gone. Your life is yeah. going to be fantastic. Yeah, autistic there's kids a, become autistic adults become autistic seniors exactly and you know and um autism edmonton has this program called gray equals great and it's for people over 50. and we were talking one night and they said oh so i love that what... title i just got it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, it took uh, me a second <laughs> yeah and she said so what is it that as you age what scares you and i said that i'm going to wind up somewhere like say in, in a in a lodge or a care home or whatever and my friends aren't going to be around to explain what goes on in my life and explain for me, explain others to me. 
So I'm scared to death that I'm going to be out there by myself. Wow. And people don't think about that. You know, they think, yeah, we're all going to get older. We're all going to wind up somewhere like that. But yeah, I think different than you. And sometimes I can't advocate for myself because people think I'm too smart to be to have Asperger's. It's like, well, I've got news for you. It's not about how smart you are. It's what, you know, what gets in your way or whatever. Absolutely. Um, and Terry, I noticed so a lot in your um, in your presentation, uh, you you use we, um, and uh, I imagine that's because throughout your life you have had direct contact and lived experience with other people who either have a diagnosis of Asperger's or or. Uh, autism and mm -hmm. you had these shared experiences and so that's why mm -hmm. you felt comfortable and confident to and it's and and we don't want to make sweeping generalizations about everybody no. with that diagnosis but um, I imagine you used we because you you are connected in so deeply to this community that you have talked to them about these shared experiences perhaps some of these shared worries yeah and I've done a lot of reading as well too and so when you do that reading, it's, you know, it's obviously a different kind of connection. It's not a personal one. And I say we, because even though we're all individual, we do share similar traits. And so you can't talk about just one person at a time with Asperger's syndrome, or I'd be sitting here for the next 10 years and still not be done. Yeah. <laughs> so as much as you don't want to make sweeping generalizations, you kind of have to make some generalizations because of the traits that are shared. Mm -hmm. So we, we're, um, I had a great thought go running through my head and it ran, it just kept on going. Um, <laughs> it forgot to stop. <laughs> it pretty much. I think as a group, we need to think more of we than just I, because it's so isolating to have Asperger syndrome or an autism spectrum disorder. Like sometimes the glee and the joy you see in somebody else's face when they realize they're not the only one who struggles with this, you know, not just day to day, sometimes it's minute to minute. It's kind of like somebody who's gone to AA for the first time and they're just like a raging alcoholic and they think that there's nobody else in the world like them, right? And then they meet this group of people who have the same struggles even though they're, everybody's struggles are similar, they're individual because we're all individuals. And I think we need to, needs to be more solidarity within the, within the autism community. And there's a, there's this, you know, real struggle going on right now with this person first thing with it, not calling it Asperger syndrome anymore because of blah, you know, it's like, you know what? We struggle with a lot of the same stuff. Why can't we just be a group of individuals who struggle with the same stuff? If you want to be called blah, blah, you know, I have autism, not, you know, not be, you know, you want to be person centered. Totally cool with that. Let me be who I am, but know that we struggle the same. We hurt the same. You know what? There was that poem that the one line in it is we all bleed red. Uh -huh. And we do. And we just, our brains are wired a bit differently than yours. So I think this community, it needs to become more equitable. We need to show a lot more solidarity with each other than we do. And sometimes there's a huge divide in the autism community. And they're working towards a national autism strategy. Um, yeah. The Canadian Journal of Autism Equity is out there and it is about equity. We want equity with, within our community but also within society. Mm -hmm. And those are things that as individuals, no matter where we are on that spectrum, and it's a huge spectrum that we can all contribute to in, in whatever way we can, be it big or be it little, but because we're all people and we all have the capability to give and the ability to think, we can make a little change towards helping things become more equitable towards helping build that solidarity so that you know we can be our own community but we can also be part of the, uh, the world community too yeah absolutely um so i've got my eye on the time we've got 11 minutes left okay. um 
I was just wondering if uh, you did have a slide, Terry, with your contact oh, information. Yes. Yeah, I just thought we could move to that and, <laughs> and, and, and leave it up um, just yeah, for our participants. It. That's okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate you um, sharing your contact information and uh, what you can, uh, the different types of services that you can provide. And I'm just going to be really selfish here. The final question of our evening is actually mine. Okay. <laughs> so I hope that's okay. Oh, no um, and it's kind of a, it's, I, I, I like this question and I, I love the answers that I get when I pose it. It to um, to autistics. Um, so, if if an autism serving organization could do anything, no limit on time, money, or resources, what should mm -hmm. they do? What what would what should they create? <laughs> they need to. It's a blue sky. The sky's the limit. There is no limit. You know what they need to do? They need to foster an attitude of acceptance. For everyone on the spectrum and they don't which is really surprising when you consider what they do mm -hmm. not everyone is treated equally mm -hmm. and you know what you don't need money to do that you don't mm -hmm. need to have all sorts of expensive equipment to do that i think what it comes down to and it's something that we all can probably do more of every day is be kind mm -hmm. and be accepting of who each one of us is Mm -hmm. But that acceptance has to start with self. Right. And that is a brutally hard journey. And even though, for the most part, I love and honor who I am, there's days I struggle to accept this Asperger part of me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seems to, to get in the way, like, it's... I'm finding, I'm, I'm trying to meet new people and make new friends and stuff, and things are going along swimmingly. And then I throw out the A word, as I started to call it. No. <laughs> and they, just, they cut and run. It's like, okay, you liked me before I told you about this. I'm not mm -hmm. any different other than the fact yeah. that I'm being honest with you that I have this, this quirk, we'll call it a quirk. It's more yeah. than one, but anyways, you know, you don't need to get into semantics, but it it totally changes people's perception and it's like i've gone from being oh you're kind of cool yeah i think i could be friends with you hang out with you do whatever and like not even a see ya they're just gone mm. <laughs> you know so and you know what i'm 60 and it still hurts mm -hmm. i was talking to a friend about it the other day and i said you know i just i cannot believe how much it still hurts and i think that's why i've been so reluctant for so many years to to reach out and to really want to work at learning how to make friends mm -hmm. because people find out who you are and they go and it's like and that's i'm not any different than i was three minutes ago went before i told you mm -hmm. but, but i mean i think of my sister she married this guy and then after they'd been married two months and he hit a um a depressive episode she found out he was bipolar he never told her she found mm -hmm. out the hard way yeah you know and she wouldn't have cut and run on the guy but it would have been kind of handy to know mm -hmm. that this goes on so <laughs> yeah I like, to, I like to be honest you know if i was a diabetic i would tell you that i was a diabetic because there's things then that we have to watch well i mm -hmm. have asperger syndrome and i have some triggers so yes there's some things i have to watch mm -hmm. but first and foremost i am a person with feelings mm -hmm. and the fact that i have asperger syndrome or an autism spectrum disorder you know call it whatever you want to call it, doesn't take away from the fact that I am a person first, mm -hmm. as all of us are. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that is a fantastic point and note uh, to end our evening on. And Terry, I just want to thank you so much again for your candor and your humor and for being willing to share your story and uh, provide some helpful tips and tricks and tools. Um, and I think, yeah, the 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 closing note of um, what we all need is just more kindness and acceptance and recognizing each person's uniqueness, regardless of a of a diagnosis or an A word. <laughs> yeah, the A word. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, and yeah, a, a huge thank you to our participants and for engaging in the chat and uh, and the fantastic questions. And of course, um, a big thank you to Community Education Service for providing mm -hmm. us with uh, the platform and the support. It um, absolutely was a pleasure. And and Terry, there's you can check that box. Your first vir virtual presentation, and mm -hmm. I'm an in-person you know event person yeah. too. I, I much prefer it, but you you really did a fantastic job. Thank you. And thank yeah. you for asking me to and giving me the opportunity to come share my story yeah, and to, absolutely. to maybe help make a difference in some people's lives. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. that very much. Great. And on that note, I will wish everybody a great evening and um, thank you so much again for tuning in. Okay. Night, guys. Good night.